Well, good afternoon. Why don't you introduce? I, I love this setup. This is this is filmmaking <laughs> at its finest. I mean, it's seriously. Imagine I'm mocking. No, it's it's. Uh, it's I it used is. to carry a real fancy big camera. What's the point? What's the point? This is, this is yeah. the future. Right Five, Fifteen dollars. This was the best fifteen dollars I ever spent. I'm why don't you introduce yourselves for, uh, to our audience? Uh, I'm Paul Provenza. I'm a comedian, actor, writer, uh, footstool, lampshade. I do white housework. Uh, follow me on Twitter. And you have a... <laughs> <laughs> follow me on Twitter. You have a show that, you're, that you uh, uh, yes, produce I, uh, and direct and write and star in? Yes. I, uh, the Green Room with Paul Provenza is my series currently on Showtime. Uh, season two will be premiering this summer all through July and August. And uh, it's very informal. It's, uh, it's hanging out with comedians behind closed doors, having fun with each other, not caring what an audience thinks, speaking their minds, uh, going places that are unexpected, uh, all very spontaneous. Great. And uh, as I told you, this is for a podcast called Skeptic's Guide to Government. So uh, Look, how Skeptic's would you... Guide to Government, that needs to be, it, it, the Gideons, the, the, there should be an equivalent organization to the Gideons, just leaving skeptics' guides to government in drawers and <laughs> hotel rooms. And, yeah. How um, what? How would you, as a satirist, uh, approach uh, looking at government? Well, you know that's the thing: is that if you're going to look at government right out of the gate, you have to be skeptical because that's kind of how certainly democracy is supposed to work is to put everybody's feet to the fire and make sure that people are doing the right thing and they're not going to do it themselves and they're not going to do it to each other. So if we're not skeptical about everything and anything that comes out of government, then government is uncontrolled. What, uh, what are some of the things that a satirist and a comedian is able to do that, um, uh, that uh, a pundit in the newspaper or an editorialist can't do. Right. Comedians, satirists, people who work in comedy uh, are able to really speak their minds and they don't have to answer to anybody. The only thing they have to answer to is their own greed, ultimately. If they want everybody to love them and go buy their CDs and come see their shows, then they're going to want to not offend anybody. If they don't care about that, they're fine with making the living that, they're, that they can make being who they are then they can say whatever they want. They don't have to answer to anybody. And, you know, we're not policy makers. We're not answer, we don't have to answer for anything we believe. Most comedians really truly are very individualistic, critical thinkers, and uh, they see bullshit where they see bullshit, and they don't care whether it's coming from the left, the right, or any party affiliation. So that's one of the, the great things about hearing really good comedians or satirists comment on things is that you're getting it unfiltered. It's not coming through uh, a corporation, it's not coming through a, a network, it's not coming through an editor, it's a person who spent a lot of time thinking about this with no barrier between their thoughts and feelings and opinions and you. And so you get a lot of truth. Sometimes they're wrong, but it takes a lot of courage to be wrong and put it out there and, and, and play with it. You know, and, and, and just get the dialogue going, which is really what most of us ultimately just hope for, is if we just get people talking about things and let them make up their own minds, then we've actually accomplished something. The outcome's irrelevant. Last night, actually, it was funny. I was talking about uh, potentially interviewing you today with my wife, and I, the Colbert Report came yeah, up. Yeah. And she said, do you know, I just realized that a lot of people on the right actually think that he's serious. Yeah. You know, that yeah. it's not satire. They take it as a, ser as a serious, yeah. well, someone from their side uh, looking at it. He actually well, talks about that in, in my book, Satiristas. He talks about, um, about just that. Uh, I said to him, I said, I, I have to believe that whoever booked you, Stephen, to do the White House press court dinner, had to believe that you were really a right-wing person. Maybe they just thought you were a funny right-wing person, but... They could not have done that with full knowledge that they were letting the fox into the hen house. And they said, somebody must have gotten fired or better have their tax records in impeccable order. Um, and he talked a lot about how there, there definitely is some confusion. He talks about you know speaking to people at the Republican convention who really don't get it. They don't get that he was actually mocking them. And, um, uh, and so the question came up, so like, 
what do you do about that? What's your, what's your responsibility as somebody who cares about these things? And he goes, I care about them only as much as my ideas are expressed clearly and people laugh at them and find them entertaining. What anybody does with any of that, I have no control over and I can't let it de determine what I do. So that's one of the things that makes Colbert so interesting is that it, it is such a good satire that you, there are people who are going to go, it's not satire, it's real. You know, um, that's Jonathan Swift territory, you know. Oh, yeah, definitely. Which is, yeah. which is hard to come by yeah. these days. No, Govind's travel, probably one of the... Uh, <laughs> well, um, a Modest Proposal, yeah. you know, Modest Proposal was regarded at the time, in which he says, to solve the problem of uh, Irish overpopulation, we should eat Irish children. You know, oh yeah, uh, but that's I right. Mean, he I mean, was really, people really took him seriously, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and he never denied that, that he meant it. Which yeah. makes it even funnier. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's the amazing thing with uh, some satirists and um, uh, like Stephen Colbert and uh, and some others who are basically they they've made the commitment to live uh, a uh, persona right. outside of their own house all the time. Right. It has well, to a, be hard. That's actually that's pretty rare. I mean, that's another thing that sets Stephen Colbert. Uh, apart from everyone else because he did take that really hard road. He actually kind of fell, fell into, you know, he was doing it as a correspondent on The Daily Show and it turned into something bigger than him. Uh, he actually said that, if, you know, if thinking about it now, I probably would have used a, a character name, <laughs> but it was too late. Um, uh, but that's why you don't see many people doing that because it does actually. And I, 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 like, I, think, I think Ann Coulter actually is a satirist. I mean, I think she's definitely a right-wing person, but she's all show business. And uh, I had the dubious distinction of being the guest, the most hated guest on uh, Red Eye on Fox uh, from an episode where she was so offended by me that she refused to sit next to me and change her seat and everything, <laughs> which was very funny. And, and you know, that's one of those things that when I look at that, I go, well, obviously I don't care what the people who hate me think. I'm here to entertain the people who happen to find what, what, what this is all about, what I'm saying, interesting, however few may be watching, that's all I can do. I'm not going to suddenly cater to that audience. And so I thought it was hilarious. And truth is that we discussed on commercial breaks how funny it would be if she actually did change her seat. And we went back and forth. So she knows it's all show business, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, while her core beliefs may be the same, she's really almost satirizing her own beliefs. And so the idea of Stephen Colbert being misunderstood, well, I think you have the actual illustration of that in Ann Coulter. She's got to be, you know, she's a character. She absolutely is a character. She's putting it on to sell books and do speaking engagements at about $30,000 a pop. <laughs> and nice work if you can get it. No, no kidding, uh, right? Uh, that brings up the question about uh, news. Is news news? Is it entertainment? Is, what, what's your view of I don't know news? what I don't know what the hell news is, but it's certainly not news. I mean, you know, 60% of every cutaway is to some box pop, and I don't give a shit what, the, what a... What the, 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 Joe Blow on the street thinks about geopolitics. He doesn't know shit. And that's most of what passes for news these days. Most of what passes for news is editorializing. You know, and um, uh, that's why people, there are some people who talk about the uh, Pew, Research, Pew Research Center study that says that uh, most uh, 18 to 25 year olds or 18 to 29 year olds uh, get their news from The Daily Show. And people go, oh my God, that's you know the beginning and the end. But actually, if you really think about it, The Daily Show actually does convey information. The Daily Show will actually say, well, this person said this, but look at all this videotape we have of what they really you know, are doing. And uh, they'll take stories that are buried in major news outlets and put them up at the top and spend some time talking about them and doing some satire on them. So in actual point of fact, you actually are getting new information from places like The Daily Show. And a lot of what is important information is how much bullshit we're getting through media. So really, in fact, The Daily Show is closest to real usable information than most news stories are. How do you, uh, how do you feel the average person, though, uh, should look at uh, government and uh, and the people who are running for, in politics, you know, the politicians. Uh, what, what should the average person do in order to be able to cut through all the bull? Uh, I, I think we all need to look at politics, media, uh, and, and the corporate universe with the paramount skepticism because all of those have an agenda. 
and the agenda is their own. It has nothing to do with the well-being of society or humankind or our country or anything. And um, so uh, anything that helps people question, anything that forces people to wonder if they're getting the real story or to hear something and go, hmm, I wonder what the opposite point of view is. Anything that does that and allows people to make up their own minds is, is the way to go because we have no trusted news sources anymore. Most of my trusted news sources are journalists like uh, John Pilger. Uh, it's a very small, small handful of journalists who I really, truly trust anymore. So I don't believe anybody. So I'm always, I watch the news and to me it's just like, it's kind of like watching sports highlights. It's mm -hmm. not the whole game, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I know that. And um, uh, the more you do realize, the more you do discover the other aspects to any given story, and I'm not even the editorializing, I'm just talking about the factual aspects of it. Uh, many of which are often in dispute, you know. The more you look at those things, you just realize that nobody is telling the truth and everybody is in it for some agenda of their own, either power or money. That's all it boils down to. So um, what do we do with that information? I don't know. We're flirting with the territory of nihilism. But I'll tell you something. I can't wait for it all to come crashing down. Well, it's the, that's a comedian's dream. Uh, well, I know. I'm, I'm talking seriously like, like Mad Max kind of stuff. Like, like, I am going to be laughing my ass off when people are having to blow guys in the alleyways for water. That's yeah. going to be hilarious to me. Well, uh, that's, that's almost my feelings with global warming. You know, it's uh, I, I, the, the, the bad part of my anticipation of what's going to happen is I'm going to say, ha ha. Uh, <laughs> you said this would never happen. You, you, yeah, so you, the only thing you have going for you is the potential schadenfraud of, uh, of the inevitable. Yeah. Well, that's as reasonable a place to be as any, I suppose. Yeah. I don't know. Well, well, as George Carlin said, it's really very entertaining. When you really you, you take a step back and you look at it in big picture, uh, in a big picture sense, uh, um, uh, you know, forget the minutia of policy, forget politicking, forget all that sort of stuff, and just look in, in terms of the broad strokes of history and empires and civilizations and even further away, species, you know, and you realize that um, uh, it's a big circus. As, as George Carlin put it, and I find this so beautiful, he goes, when you're born in the world, you're given a ticket to the freak show. When you're born in America, you get a front row seat. And some of us, like you and me, have our notebooks. And all we can do is just report to the others what we're seeing from up front. That's it. Great, thank you. Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, you can find me on Facebook on the Satiristas page. Let me, let me hold that up so you can see what I'm talking about here. This is the uh, Satiristas. It's a terrific Facebook page, actually, because a lot of the comedians in the book interact on that page with fans. Uh, and uh, the Green Room with Papa Venza on Showtime this summer. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.